Hello everybody, my name is Vlad Kachu. In this video I'd like to tell you about the history of chess since the time the game was invented till the present. It has long been noticed that the art of chess is more intensely developed in the regions and countries which are at the peak of the cultural progress. This situation can be traced over the entire history of the game, which counts many centuries. But let us begin at the beginning. The anchoring point is considered to be the appearance of the game of Chaturangar, that literally means four armies, in India at the end of the 5th century. The game was played by four players, two against two. The pieces were of the black, yellow, green and red colors. Also it was a dice game. At first Chaturanga, the remote predecessor of chess, was conceived as a simulation of the art of war. Accordingly, the pieces used in such a game were supposed to imitate the different corps. Pawns represented infantry, knights, cavalry, bishops fighting elephants, which were actively used then in the east, rooks, chariots, kings impersonated supreme rulers. However, there was no sign of queens at the time. There is also a well-substantiated Chinese version of the origin of chess. I advise those who are interested in it to read the reference we are excited here. But let us return to India. Legend has it that a diamond-encrusted chess set was sent to the Shah of Iran as a pre present with the suggestion that he should guess the meaning of the game. The state prestige was at stake, and on the fourth day of brainstorming, one of the Persian wise men succeeded in comprehending the rules of the game. This story was vividly narrated by Ferdowsi in his great epic Shahnameh. In the new cultural environment, the game underwent great changes, getting the name Shatranj and becoming a two-handed game in which dice were no longer used. In the year 638, Persia was invaded by the Arabs and the game began to spread throughout the territory of expanding Muslim world. Together with algebra, medicine and astronomy, chess took its place at the court of the caliphs. Soon first famous masters of the game appeared and with them the first chess book, Kitab Mansubat Ash Shatranj. The Arab masters were the first to formalize the rules of the game on 64 squares. And gradually chess started to develop into something more than just a model of war and game of luck, into art. Asuli, Al Adli and Al Razi, best known of chess aces of that epoch, created real masterpieces which were as admired as beautiful paintings. In Arab Andalusia, in the territory of modern Spain, chess was even taught at the universities beginning from the 8th, 8th century. And now we have come to the next stage in the spreading of chess, the European. Chess got to Europe with the Arab conquests via Spain and Sicily. It also found its way to Eastern Europe and Russia via the Caucasus and Central Asia. Almost two centuries had passed before the novelty became fully adapted by the European, Europeans, because only with the appearance of the feudal system the game started to correspond to the local cultural values. Thus the elephant turned into the bishop, the rooks into towers providing a safe shelter, hosts became medieval knights, pawns perfectly personified serfs. Finally, the figurine of Fers, that is, a vizier or counselor, turned into the queen standing next to the king. The newfangled game ideally reflected the notion held by the nobility about honor and duty. It may be said that the game was shaping the style of the time. Suffice it to mention that chess was one of the seven arts mandatory for requirement by night, and wrote in 1270 the book Judez de Sec Moralisé had become the second most published in the West after the Bible. It's interesting to know that a game of chess offered a rare opportunity for getting together with one's lady love, while to lose her game was equivalent to the declaration of love. It is in the Middle Ages that chess acquired the reputation of the king's game. They came the 15th century, the Renaissance, and again chess absorbed the social changes. The queen becomes the most powerful piece on the chessboard, reflecting the new role of woman in the society. Suffice to mention Isabella, the Queen of Spain, and Elizabeth, the Queen of England. The leading chess masters of that epoch were Spanish and Italian. Some of their games have been preserved and they enrapture me mightily. Never again has the game been so romantic and sparkling as it was at that period. Perhaps it had something to do with discovery of new continents and islands. 
In the 18th century, however, this situation began to change. The formation of the colonial system gave rise to rationalization of the game and the attitude towards it, and the best players at the time were French and British. The first great chess player, and also a composer of music, by the way, who developed a coherent scientific system was André Philidor. He transferred the principles of the Enlightenment to the chess ground. Now the rationality and reasonableness in everything becomes prevailing. Today it's not easy to believe, but in Paris, the world intellectual center of the time, one of the first open cafes was, was the chess cafe, Café de la Régence. It attracts all the luminaries of the period, Robespierre, Benjamin Franklin, Beaumarchais, Murat, and Napoleon himself too. As everywhere, the confrontation between the French and English masters rules over the chess world as well. In 1834, MacDonald sends a challenge to La Bourdonnais, and their match is regarded as the first world championship match in history. Nine years later, Howard Staunton and Saint Amand play a match for the title of the strongest player, a title generally recognized but still unofficial. Having won the match, Staunton founds in 1857 the first chess association. To him, we also owe the present shape of chess figurines. The first Staunton chessmen were produced in 1832. Keeping abreast of the triumphant scientific revolution, chess players organized in 1844 the first match by the Telegraph between Washington and Baltimore, and in 1902 the first chess radio match takes place. In 1886, there appears the first official world chess champion, native of Prague, Wilhelm Steinitz. Steinitz's picture is the first in a row of world chess champions' portraits adorning any chess club. After his, there come the portraits of Lasker, Capablanca, Alokin, Oliver. Around that time, the struggle of women for their rights was reflected in chess as well. Vera Menchik proved her ability to be absolute equal with men having become the first grandmaster of the fair sex and, with it, the first Roman's chess champion, thus setting up a tradition of tournament matches for the title of the world's strongest women chess player. Since then, as you can see, the women's chess crown changed hands many times, and another defeat of a man's champion by a graceful female hand is no longer a surprise for anybody. It is at the turn of the 20th century that the chess players failed to settle the issue of intellectual rights on the games played, and I'm sure that it became an impediment to the development of chess in the West. In 1924, the International Chess Federation, FIDE, was founded in Paris, and it so happened that at about the same time the foundation is laid for the subsequent total domination of Soviet chess players. Suffice it to say that in the 1930s the number of chess players in the Soviet Union had reached a million. Even a film was shot, The Chess Rush. The point is that, under the conditions of the confrontation between social systems, chess was found to be a very cheap and demonstrative method to prove superiority of one of the systems. In 1948, the strongest Soviet chess player of the time, Mikhail Batvinik, becomes the world champion. Subsequently, the world chess crown changed hands among the brilliant players of Soviet players. Smyslov in 1957, Tal in 1960, Petrosan in 1963, Spassky in 1969. But this situation couldn't continue forever. In 1972, at the peak of the Cold War, the American Grandmaster Robert Fisher showed that a single genius could withstand the whole system. But not for long. Fisher forfeits the title and it goes back to the Soviet Union first to Anatoly Karpov, then to Garry Kasparov. Never again was repeated such a public interest in the ancient game as in 1972 during the match Spassky Fischer or in 1980s, the time of confrontation between Karpov and Kasparov. Chess multiplied by politics had a cumulative effect. Only in 1996, when Kasparov played a match with the IBM supercomputer, Chess returned to the front pages of the newspapers. Meanwhile, in early 1990s, for the first time in the history of chess, there occurred the great mess with tournaments for the title of the strongest chess player, since the undisputed world chess champion of the time, Garry Kasparov, decided to defend his title outside the official organization. 
Happy Day. As a result, in 1993 the match against Nigel Short was held under the auspices of the Times. For some time the situation in chess resembled the state of thing in boxing. Kasparov kept playing his matches under the aegis of alternative organizations. In 1996 against Anand, in the year 2000 against Kramnik. At the same time, FIDE started to hold its world championships on a new knockout system. I don't want to go deep into details of all those past battles. As the final result, two different branches brought new champions, though sometimes they had to share the throne. Kramnik in the year 2000, according to their position line, Karpov in 1998, Kalifman in 1999, Anand in the year 2000, Panamarov in 2001, Kasimjanov in 2004, and finally Topalov in 2005, under the FIDE version, added their names to the history of chess. And no matter within the frames of which system, they've managed to do so. Only in 2006, all the chess devotees breathed a sigh of relief when the cherished dream of Kirsan Limjin, the FIDE incumbent president, came true and the uniting match between Kramnik and Topalov was arranged, thus putting a stop to the schism. And now we have come to the present days. In some sense, the historical circle is closed, for it is an Indian, Viswanathan Anand, who is the world chess champion now, and chess is undergoing the most dynamic development exactly in India and China. As before, our game takes a unique position in the intellectual life of society. For example, in many countries chess becomes a part of general education program, and I believe that in the nearest future each and every country will be involved in this innovation. The Chess Olympiads, which have been held every second year since 1927, are attended by representatives of the utmost end of our planet. Still, it seems chess has to adapt yet again to new realities, be it a consumer society, globalization or whatever.